You can be seated. Uh, we're running about 15 minutes behind, but don't worry, I only have 11 pages of notes. <laughs> Amen. Yeah, God's the author of time. Amen. He'll take care of things. So we are on a sermon series called Just Dig It, and I've explained that this is more than just a sermon series. It's a theme that we have for the year, that we're believing God. Um, the rest of that is deeper and more in 2024. And again, as I said last week, it's not just a cute saying. It's, it's a desire of our hearts, amen? And it's what, we, what we're looking to do in the days, weeks, months ahead is to press into God to get more of Him. Amen? And so that's our heart's desire uh, throughout this year and, and, and every year is we want to have more of God in our lives. And, and the just dig it goes along with it because there's a part that we play in order to get more of God. Amen? We got to dig. We got to go after Him, right? We got to get in His Word. We got to, if, if you want to know somebody, right? A good way of getting to know them better is read their biography. Amen? And so when you pick up that Bible, that's God's heart in letter form, right? And so when we begin to read the Bible, we begin to find out who God is. We begin to discover how faithful is he, he is, how good He is, how powerful He is. We begin to see Him as He is as we look at Him in His Word. And so we need to dig in. Amen? And we're going to go deeper and more through that process. Last week, we talked about the price of glory. And that was part of it, ta talking about digging in. In this series, I've been doing my best to capture what the Lord has spoken to us through the prophetic that's come, come out over this past few months. The Lord spoke to Pastor Tim about establishing us, right, in this region and pouring out His glory. And that the Lord has granted to us the keys of the kingdom. He desires to do signs, wonders, and miracles among us that we would be like a hospital where people come to be healed and delivered. Amen? This has always been our heart here at Transformation Church from the moment that we open the doors. And it goes along with the dream that God recently gave me, right? Uh, about stirring up the anointings of old and entering into a place of signs, wonders, and miracles. And this is when God directed me to redig the wells of Jacob. Amen? And this is where this ministry theme has come from for 2024. Again, just dig it deeper and more in 2024. Then Terry Fletcher uh, came and visited us. And Terry usually comes with a word from the Lord. And so when he came, he shared the word with us. And one of the things that was in that word, we have it uh, printed and uh, if you want a copy of that, we can get you it. But um, one of the things that was in that word was that Transformation Church is an Isaiah 58 church. Amen? And I don't know if you know this or not, but sometimes God speaks things into existence. Has anybody ever heard that happen before? Yeah. All throughout the Bible, God is speaking things into existence. And so when He calls us an Isaiah 58 church, that doesn't mean we've arrived at that place. It means that God is speaking that over us as a body of believers and desires for us to enter into that. But there's a, normally, uh, when words are given like that, there's a part that we play to live that out, to step that out, to see God move in and through it. Amen? So he explained that God was calling us to be a repairer of broken down walls and a restorer of the city. He said that this would be accomplished through the apostolic and prophetic flowing together as one stream. And so that's a lot of stuff going on there. Um, all of these words that God has given us for 2024 are very closely connected to one another. And again, this series is an attempt to capture some of these prophetic words and convey the meaning of them so that we as a church can catch the vision and run with it. Amen? I hope that you're not a Christian that a, a, thinks that Christianity is a spectator sport because you're in the wrong place, if you are. We're here to make an impact for heaven, amen? And so we want people that are on the front lines and going after God and going after the lost and going after the people around us, the unchurched, the de-churched. This isn't a little bless me club just for Christians in this place. I just want you to know that, right? And this is here to, to build you up. This is here to bless you, no doubt about it. But if you keep it to yourself, you're wrong. If you keep it to yourself, you're wrong. 
God has called us to go beyond that, to step out of ourselves and to see the world around us. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. You see, He stepped out of heaven and onto the earth. We need to step out of the church and the pews. We need to step in to the streets, the highways, and the byways, and we need to bring Jesus there. If the only time you interact with Jesus is here, there's something wrong. There's just something wrong. Again, he specifically pointed out that we would be the repairer of broken down walls and the restorer of the city. And all of this sounds really good, but guess what this chapter begins with? A stern rebuke from the Lord. And so let's take a look at Isaiah 58. We're going to start with 1 through 3a. Shout it aloud. Do not hold back. Raise your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their rebellion and to the descendants of Jacob their sins. For day after day they seek me out. They seem eager to know my ways as if they were a nation that does what is right and has not forsaken the commands of its God. They ask me for just decisions and seem eager for God to come near them. Why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen it? Why have we humbled ourselves and you have not noticed? In this first passage, right, we find Pastor Tim's got the game on. <laughs> I bind that in Jesus' name. (laughs) But look in this first passage, right? We have God rebuking his people. And he gives a disturbing description, in in my view, of the people. Because these people seem to be seeking God, right? They seem to be seeking God. It appears that they were eager to know his ways. A people who were fasting and praying, and most Christians I know don't even know what it means to fast. But these people were fasting and praying. Again, most Christians I know don't even know how to fast. And they only pray when something's wrong. And they need something. And so this is a little disturbing to me because it sounds like on the outside that these people were going after God. They were hungry to know His ways. They were eager for Him. They were asking Him for just decisions. They were fasting. They were praying. But there was something wrong even in all that. Going on to 3b. Yet on the day of your fasting, God said, you do as you please and exploit all of your workers. Your fasting ends in quarreling and strife and in striking each other with wicked fists. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. Is this the kind of fast I have chosen? Only a day for people to humble themselves. Is it only for bowing one's head like a reed and for lying in sackcloth and ashes? Is that what you call a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? He's basically telling them that you're just going through the motions. You're just going through the motions in this whole thing. Yes, you're doing what you know to be right, but you're just going through the motions. Your heart is not in it. You praise me with your lips, but your heart is far from me. This is what God is saying to the people. And I don't, as I was reading that, I don't want that to be me. I don't want me to just look like I'm seeking God on the outside, but my heart being far from Him. And as I read this, my heart breaks. I say, Lord, I don't want that from myself. Lord, don't allow me. To be one of these people. God, give me a pure heart that seeks after you. And so as I read this, this is what's coming to my heart, to my mind. He explains that they've totally missed the heart and purpose of fasting. They're arguing and fighting and taking advantage of one another in the middle of their fasting. And God says no. And I thought about this and and, and repented in some of the areas of my life because I don't want this to be me. I don't want this to be me. I want to avoid meaningless arguments. I want to humble myself and fast and pray. I want to focus my attention on the Lord. These are all things that are coming to my mind. 
as I'm thinking about what God's saying to these people. And then God tells them what they should be doing. Listen in verses 6 and 7. Is not this the kind of fast that I've chosen to loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke? Are you listening? To set the oppressed free and break every yoke. Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter? When you see the naked to clothe them and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood. This is the heart and desire that many of us share here at Transformation Church to be a people like this. But do our lives align with this truth? Do our lives align with this lifestyle of dying to ourselves and living for the people around us? Giving ourselves fully to the world around us so that Jesus can be seen in and through us. The Apostle Paul said, it's no longer I who live, but Christ living in me. Right? This is my heart's desire. This is my heart's desire to become like that, to enter into that lifestyle where it's no longer I who live, but Christ living in me and through me to a lost and dying world around me and to see people's chains broken over their lives and then released into freedom, right? To see the captives set free, to see the blind eyes open, to see the lame leaping for joy. Is there a desire in your heart to see God moving in and through you today? This is what Isaiah 58 is all about. We want to see this. We want to know God's ways. However, we cannot ignore God's rebuke and hope to still operate in His power and fulfill His plans. We cannot ignore God's rebuke. We have to listen to what God's saying to our lives, and we need to apply what He's saying in our lives, not just putting it off till another day, not just being okay with staying where we're at. We need to take what God has spoken and apply it to our lives so that we can see change. Now listen, I understand that Jesus has already paid the price. I understand that we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Nobody should be put down. Nobody should. But at the same time, if there are things that God is speaking, you need to act on the things that God is speaking to your life. It's not a small thing what God is speaking to you. It might seem small, but it's big in the eyes of heaven. And if you're faithful with little, God will entrust you with much. But you got to start right where you're at right now. We are crying out to God to see His glory, to operate in that power, to fulfill His plans in the earth around us. If we truly desire to enter into genuine Christianity, we must humble ourselves and examine our lives in the light of God's rebuke. of God's voice, of what God is speaking. Again, we can no longer continue to embrace cultural Christianity. Christianity isn't just going to church once a week. I don't care how many times you go to church. It's about a heart condition. It's about a lifestyle that you have. Not just getting filled up and 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 not making an impact on the world around you. It's about getting filled up to be poured out. God wants to bless you so that you can be a blessing. How easy is it for you to ignore the people around you every day? that are going to die and go to hell? How easy is it for you to ignore the people that are in bondage within your realms of influence? I'm, I'm preaching to myself today as well. How easy is it for us to do? It's really easy because we've gotten into a groove of it, right? We've gotten into a routine of just blocking everything else out and just taking the next step and going through the motions. But what about the people around us? What about the people around us 
that don't know Jesus? What about the people around us that are all bound up? What about the people around us? You know that the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead is living in you? What are you doing with the power that resides within you through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit? You are now a temple of the Holy Spirit. And I don't know about you, but I read this parable that talked about a manager giving talents to certain workers and then coming back and and, and wanting to know what they did with it. You have all of the power of heaven on the inside of you. What are you doing with it? What am I doing with it? Are we making an impact for God's glory? I'm telling you, we're called to be an Isaiah 58 church, and an Isaiah 58 church is a church that steps out from the doors of the church, a a church that gets into those highways and byways and begins to interact with the people and make an impact in the lives of the people in the community, amen? It's not about everything that just gets done right here. There's so much more out there. Christianity is a lifestyle of becoming more and more like Jesus until we begin to think like Him, speak like Him, and act like Him until it's no longer again we who live but Christ living in us and through us. This is genuine Christianity. This is genuine Christianity. And the moment that we stop getting closer to becoming like Him is the moment that we've died spiritually. If your progress has stopped, you are dead spiritually. Thank God for His resurrection power. We need to start getting desperate for it and crying out for it because God will meet us. He will shock our heart back to life again. He will cause us to come alive in Him. This is what He desires. Isaiah 58 talks about true fasting, and in this description of true fasting, it reveals to us a picture of this genuine Christianity. Real fasting brings freedom. Real fasting brings justice. Real fasting breaks chains off of people's lives. Real fasting reaches out to the poor. Real fasting provides food for the hungry. It provides shelter for the homeless, clothing for the naked. It meets the needs of our families and our communities. This is the fast that God has chosen for us. This is the fast. This is a picture of genuine Christianity. Transformation Church is meant to be an Isaiah 58 church. We are talking about going deeper and getting more of God in 2024. We're talking about asking God to show us His ways. We're crying out to God to see His glory. And we don't want to just get God's glory for ourselves. No, we want to be vessels that get filled up and then go get poured out, as the Apostle Paul said, like a drink offering to the world around us. This is Christianity. After sharing the proper motives and actions for us to perform during fasting, this passage explains the blessings and benefits that follow true fasting. Verses 8 and 9a. Then your light will break forth like the dawn. And your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you. And the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help and he will say, here am I. When we align ourselves with the ways of the Lord, our light will break forth like the dawn. How many people want your light, God's light in you and through you to break forth like the dawn? How many people want to see God's glory manifest in the world around them? We need to cry out for it more and more and more. We need to set our hearts towards it. We need to go after God and not be satisfied until He hears our prayers and answers them. Right? This is what the Bible tells us. Knock and keep on knocking. Ask and keep on asking. Seek and keep on seeking. 
right? This is who gets the answers that they're looking for, are the ones that never quit. They keep pressing in and pressing in and pressing in and crying out to God over and over and over again. Lord, make us this people. Make us this people. It's talking about God's glory in us and through us to that world around us. You, as we said last week, you are the light of the world. You are the light of the world. If you hide that light, the world will remain dark. But when you shine the light of God into the world around you, light will come and everything will be lit up. You can't complain about how dark the world is if you ain't shining the light of Jesus to the lost and dying world around you. You can't complain about it. You can't tell us how terrible things are around us. Why? Because you're the light. You are the light of the world, and you are meant to shine your light for all the world to see. And that requires you to open your mouth. It requires you to take action. It requires you to get up and go. And when you find injustice, you confront it. You don't just let it keep going on and say, oh, the world's getting dark. No, you're the answer. You're God's answer for the darkness that's overtaking the world. You're the answer. What are you doing about it? How are you shining your light? What is your solution to the world's problems? Find injustice. Confront it. This is what God is calling us to do and to be. This passage is telling us how to shine the light of the Lord. It says that in this moment, healing will come quickly. Your righteousness will go before you. The glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. When we align ourselves with truth, God goes before us and hems us in with his glory from behind. When our hearts are right and we call upon the Lord, God's promise is that he will answer. Amen? When we cry for help, God will say, here I am. Isaiah 58, 9b to 12, if you do away with the yoke of oppression, that means you stop manipulating people, stop controlling people, stop deceiving people. If you do away with the yoke of oppression, with the pointing finger and malicious talk, and if you spend yourselves in behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness and your night will become like the noonday. Oh my goodness, come on, somebody get happy in here. Somebody shout out loud because this is the reward for those who align their hearts with God and begin to step out in this lifestyle. Your light's going to shine, man. All of these things are going to happen. The night will become like noonday. The Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land and will strengthen your frame. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. So when all the world is like a dry desert, you're going to be like this well, right? This spring of water whose waters never fail. That's what you're going to be. Why? Because your trust and your hope isn't in the world around you. It's in Him. Amen? And when your hope is in Him, you are a well-watered spring whose waters never fail, even in a sun-scorched land. Listen, we, when we were back in the, in the back room today praying, the word of the Lord came that there's a shaking that's coming. There's a shaking that's coming. But before that word came that there's a shaking that's coming, the word came for us to shake ourselves, for us to shake ourselves and not to stay where we were at, not to allow the things that are in our lives that we know shouldn't be there to stay there, but to shake those things off because we have authority to shake those things off and to get rid of them. And when we shake those things off and get rid of those things that are in our lives that are holding us back from this life that we're talking about, when we shake those things off, then when the shaking of the Lord comes, we will be unshakable. Because we've taken the authority and we've shaken those things off before he gets here to shake everything that can be shaken. And when we have shaken them off already, we become unshakable. Amen? And so this is, this, is, this is the preview. This is what God wants you to know. Shake those things off now so that you won't be shaken later. 
Shake it now. Judge yourselves lest you be judged. Get rid of the things. Like, like was said in that song or somebody said up here, bring it to the altar. Lay it down. Get rid of it. Don't allow it in your life any longer. Oh, Jesus. Your people will rebuild the ancient ruins. Listen, man, there's some ancient ruins in this country. There's some ancient ruins. Oh, this country? No, what are you talking about, ancient ruins? I'm talking about the foundations of our forefathers. I'm talking about, I'm talking about this, this, this spiritual experiment that they were doing. Amen? This beautiful thing that they that they that, that, that God placed in their hearts to see come to pass there are some ancient ruins there is purity and righteousness and holiness in the foundations of this country and we need to build again those ancient ruins we need to come back to that foundation of faith that the people had when they came here I'm not talking about all the bad things and the negative things. I'm talking about their hearts towards God and their desire to please Him and to have a nation that followed Him. Amen? We need to build again those ancient ruins. This is an Isaiah 58 church. And raise up the old age, old, age old foundations. You will be called the repairer of broken walls, the restorer of streets with dwellings, or the city. Again, this is that part where the apostolic and the prophetic flow together to bring this to pass. There cannot be malicious talk and pointing of fingers among us. We must repent and turn from these ways. We need to love one another and love those around us. Amen? We need to care about every person who comes through our doors. We need to show them Christ's kindness. Then your light will rise in the darkness. God will guide us Always, the Bible says, we will be repairers of broken down walls. We will be restorers of streets with dwellings. Who wants to see our communities returned to that firm biblical age-old foundation? Who wants to see it? Does anybody want to see it? Does anybody want to see it? There are all kinds of different things that we need to see happen in order for that to take place. See, when the walls are broken down of a city, back in ancient days, they had walls around cities. And when those walls were broken down, it means that the enemy had a clear shot to come in anytime they wanted to harass you and to rob you and to hurt you because those walls were broken down. If the walls were broken down, you were vulnerable. And what this is saying is that we, the church, are the, are the, are the restorers of broken down walls. Amen? We build again the walls. Right? Like Nehemiah, we build again the walls around the city so that the enemy can't just come in and have his way. And when, once you build those walls, now you're ready to restore the city. You can't restore the city until the walls have been built back up around the city. Because as long as the walls are down around the city, the enemy will just keep coming. And any progress you make, he'll destroy. He'll take away. And so you got to build the walls first you got to build the walls around the city so that you can begin to restore the city from the inside. This is what God has called us to do as a church family. When we establish a Christ-centered biblical culture, it builds up the walls of protection around the city. When we address those injustices as I was talking about, it builds back up the walls around our city. We need to build again the moral fabric of our society because when these walls are built up, they provide protection. Once the walls are rebuilt again, the enemy can no longer freely, freely attack and bring destruction on our communities. And once the walls of protection are built up, we can now begin again to restore that city without fear of being attacked, without fear of losing all of our progress and of things being destroyed. First, we build up the walls around the city by finding our voices and standing up for what is right. Finding our voices and standing up for what is right. We did a series on the seven spheres of influence in society and in the world, and the only thing that's going to impact these seven spheres for Jesus is a people who are committed to stepping into a genuine Christian lifestyle. We need all kind of Christians in every career field and every background to begin to live like Jesus. 
right in the middle of where you're at. You don't have to be in five-fold ministry to do what I'm talking about. In fact, if you were, we'd be in trouble. We need you where you're at because you have a realm of influence that God has assigned you to impact for His glory. You need to impact that realm of influence where you're at, whether it's government, communication, commerce, education, entertainment, family, or religion. We need to make an impact in these different areas, these spheres of society. Because if we don't take back these spheres of society, then the enemy is going to just run rampart over the, uh, the city and take away our biblical freedoms. You haven't seen anything yet, I'm telling you. It's time to shine. It's time to shine God's light. It's time not to be silent anymore. It's time to stand up. It's time to take back ground. Yeah. I know that you think the church is just something you come to on a Sunday and get a feel-good message, but that's a lie. The church is God's army, and we need to rise up as God's soldiers, and we need to go out and make an impact in the world around us. This is what the church is meant to be. We have authority to rise up, and it is a sin for us to sit back and let those who do not know the Lord make all the decisions for our communities, our schools, our communication outlets, our entertainment choices, our business sectors, our houses of worship, and even to make decisions about how we raise our own children and how we define the family unit. You know why? What's going on is going on because the church has been silent. So let me ask you, let's just make this thing count today. What's your assignment in all of what we're talking about today? We can do all that stuff. Yes, we live like Jesus, right? But there's a, a specific thing within the realm of influence that you have with the people that you interact with on a regular basis, with the systems that you interact with on a regular basis what is the assignment that God has for you in the middle of those things? I, don't, I, 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 love, I love, you know, serving in the church, and, and, and I think that that's important. But if you're not doing something outside of the church, you're missing it. What's your assignment? I want you to begin to seek heaven for your assignment, for the realm of influence that God has entrusted to you, and how you can impact that realm of influence with the gospel of Jesus Christ. You are a mighty warrior. You're more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. There's nothing that you can't do. And so if God puts it on your heart, God will supply what you need to accomplish that thing. He supplies us in abundance for every good work. That's who you serve. That's who you're with. That's, that's the one that's supplying you with what you need to get things done. We just need to align ourselves with him. It's hard sometimes to align ourselves with him because he's got these plans that are so big. And so sometimes we look at these plans that are so big and we're intimidated and we take a step back instead of stepping in. David ran to the battle line when he faced that giant. We need to step in, not shrink back. What is the assignment that God has in your life to impact the world around you. And I know that we're out of time here, but I just want to say, let's wake up. Wake up, sleeper. Wake up and shine the light of the Lord to the world around us. God wants to move in our lives today. I believe that God wants to move in a powerful way, not only in our lives, but through our lives. So who's ready to forfeit their lives for Jesus Christ? Yeah, there's a long line there, right? Who wants to forfeit your life for Jesus Christ? To die to yourself so that you can live for him. Who's ready to die for yourself, to yourself? Who's ready to live this genuine Christian lifestyle? Man, I know you're going to make mistakes. I, I make mistakes all the, all the time. I know you're going to make mistakes. Let's make them. Let's make them. Let's just be bold about making them. I like how Peter made mistakes. He was just bold about it. Let's make them big. Why? Because we're going after God, and we're going to make mistakes, and God already knows the mistakes that we're going to make, but he's bigger than our mistakes, amen? And when we make mistakes, we're going to get up, and we're not going to run away from him and go hide. We're going to run to him 
And we're going to fall at his feet and we're going to get blessed and refreshed and forgiven. And we're going to get back up and we're going to run that race with perseverance that God has set before us. Amen? This is what we're called to. This is the life that you were born to live. Have you ever wondered if there was something more to life than what you've experienced so far? Anybody ever wonder, Lord, is there something more? I, I, I guarantee you that there are many people in this room that have thought that thought or spoken those words. Lord, is there something more than what I'm experiencing now? And I want you to know that there is so much more. There is so much more. But the reason why we haven't experienced it is because we have to walk through the door of death to get to that wealthy place that he has for us on the other side. You see, you got to die to yourself to experience all that God has for you. If you hold on to your life, you're going to lose it. But if you lose your life for his sake, you'll find it. Amen? I know that, there's, I know that it's, it's intimidating to walk through that door of death. But I'm telling you that there's something on the other side of that door that nothing in this world can compare to. When you get on the other side of that thing, God will begin to work in your life and do things that you never thought possible. God, help us. Help us, Lord. Help us to walk through that door. Help us to experience all that you desire for our lives. Oh, Jesus. Before one of your days came to pass, God knew every single one of them and had them written down in his book. You just have to ask him for a glimpse. You just have to say, God, can I see that book? God, will you show me what those plans are? God, I'd like to step into the pages of that book if you'd let me. And I believe that God will take you by the hand and he'll usher you into the pages of that book and your life will never be the same again. The first step in stepping in to that plan that God has for you is to surrender your life to Jesus Christ and to ask him to forgive you of your sins and to come into your life and be your Lord and Savior. Right now, I'd just like everybody here to bow your heads, close your eyes, and search your hearts for what God's speaking to you right now. It might be something God's speaking to you about this message. It might be something God's speaking to you about giving your life to him today. Close your eyes and just seek the Lord. Bow those heads. Just whisper requests to God right now, right from your seats. God, God, I want more. God, open my eyes. God, lead me in the way that's right in your sight. God wants to do something in your life this morning. Amen. God wants to do something in your life this morning. In a minute, I'm going to count to three. As with every head bowed and eye closed, I'm going to count to three. And if you've never received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want you to raise up your hand high. I want you to shoot your hand up from your seat. And then once you shoot your hand up, I'll acknowledge that I've seen it. And then I'm going to ask you to repeat a prayer with me from your seats to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. This is the most important decision you will ever make in your entire life. God is calling you to step upon the path that he has planned for you. So again, with every head bowed and eye closed, searching our hearts together right now. Here we go. I'm going to count to three, and on the words of my mouth, when I say three, shoot up your hand. One. Two. Three, shoot up your hand right now from your seat, wherever you're at. Anybody who wants to receive the Lord, <laughs> I see that precious little hand. Anybody else that wants to receive the Lord into their lives today and step into that plan that God has for you. I'm going to give you one more minute here. If you raised your hand and you want to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I just want you to repeat this prayer after me. You might be here in this room. You might be listening online. Just repeat this prayer after me and mean it with all your heart. Say, Lord Jesus, right now, I surrender my life completely to you. And I ask you, to come into my life 
and be my Lord and Savior. I give you all of me. Help me to live for you each and every day of the rest of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, God did exactly what you asked him to do. We have a book coming up on the screen here. Again, whether you're here in this room or you're listening online, we want to put this book in your hands. If you're here in this room, these books are right out on the table before you walk into the main hallway. You can grab one free of charge. There is a phone number on the back of that book. If you have any questions as you're studying this out and reading through it, you can text or call that number and we'll answer those questions for you. The same is true of you. If you receive the Lord online, we want to send that book out to you. There's a link in that post. You can click on that link if you gave your life to Jesus and send us a message. Let us know that you want one of those books. We'll send that book out to you and believe it'll be a blessing in your life. As the ministry team comes forward this morning, I only have one call to respond to today. If there's anyone in here today who's ready to die to themselves and live for Jesus, I want to invite you to come on up here for prayer this morning. We're going to leave our pride and selfishness at the altar. We're going to leave everything else that's hindering us at the altar. And we're going to step into that genuine Christianity today. We're going to sing one last song here. And then Pastor Tim's going to close us in prayer. So let's go ahead and stand up as we close today. If you need prayer, get on up here.